at different times in my life as I'm reading through the Bible, it seems like the Lord shines a light on a passage of Scripture at a certain time just for me. Now, somebody, what people ask me from time to time, what's your favorite Scripture? I say, well, it depends on the time of life that I'm in and the Scripture that God has, sh has shown His light on. And so, for me, one of those passages of Scripture lately is Psalm 23. And so I'd like you to turn with me to Psalm 23. You see, I thought, because you've been in Genesis for so long, I thought I should maybe start by giving a, a little snapshot in, uh, of each chapter, of, or each, um, each book of the Bible to let you know there are more than books of the Bible than just Genesis. But I thought, no, no I, I won't do that. So I'm actually using you today to help me think through Psalm 23 in this transition in my life. I've had a number of transitions in my life. We all have. We all go through transitions. From here, from seminary, Carl and I went to be the ministers of youth and music in St. Louis, Missouri with my dad. I got to be on staff with my dad for two years. That was so cool. I loved that. Uh, I learned a lot, and it was just a wonderful time for us to, to be together with my dad in that setting. My plan was to stay there for four years as his assistant, get ordained, and then go pastor somewhere. Well, at two years into that, my dad comes and says, hey, I'm moving to Kansas. <laughs> what? So he moved to Kansas, and we stayed, and then eventually, another transition, we moved to Austin, Texas, to pastor First Church of the Nazarene in Austin, Texas. I said, wow, First Church, that's pretty good. Twenty people showed up. The first <laughs> people. Austin First Church. It was a dysfunctional church. The first week, one of the board members was arrested for flashing. And I'm thinking, they don't teach you what to do with about that in seminary. Well, I was going to make. Never mind. I'm going to pass on over that. But there were a number of things that happened that early church in that in those early months and weeks in those that church that just caused us to really depend on God. So that's another transition. Another transition after that, we moved to Russia for 13 years in, in Moscow. That was a huge transition. And then we moved to from there to Fort Wayne, Indiana to pastor there for about six years. Then we went to East Ohio to be co-district superintendents. And then we're here. And this transition for me, out of all those transitions, has probably been the most challenging because it is totally different than what I've ever done. And so, for me, the Lord has shined a light on the, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And so now as I'm here, as the supportive spouse of the NTS president, <laughs> I need your help. By the way, I call her Ponce. President of NTS, Ponce. So you, you need to help me help yourself. <laughs> Not sure how my future of this transition is going to shake out, but I have, I have faith that God's going to help me. Would somebody read for us Psalm 23? Somebody just read out for us Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou dost prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word, and may it reach deep into our soul. I don't know if somebody that is new to the church is new to Christianity and would read this, would scratch their head and say, Why shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd. Maybe if somebody were writing it today from our context, they would say maybe the Lord is my parent. I shall not want. The Lord is my employer. 
the Lord, or the Lord is my shepherd, the Lord is my benevolent boss, <laughs> the Lord is my stockbroker, I don't know. But maybe somebody would not put the word shepherd. I mean, it's a menial job, a smelly job, look down upon job, the Lord is my shepherd. Why the word shepherd? Help me with that as I am in this transition. Why would, why would David use the word shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd. Anybody? Shepherd yes. somebody that cares. Cares? Okay. Because that's what he was most familiar with. He was a Ooh. shepherd boy and very it good. was very meaningful to him. Very good. Anybody and else? more meaning than what it does to us, as you said. Very good. Authority. Um, he, the authority over, over us, protection, benevolent care. Actually, when David is saying, the Lord is my shepherd, it's a strong confession of faith in God. It rooted on his relationship and his experiences in the past. The Lord is my shepherd. I have experienced the Lord protecting me, guiding me, and having authority over me, the Lord is my shepherd. See, that helps me. That helps me. I think the Lord is my protector and guide. Very good. In the context of shepherd. Mm -hmm. Very good. You see, I have needed the Lord to be a shepherd in different transitions. Every transition in life. I can remember the first time I stood on Red Square. It was January. <clears throat> first time I've been to Russia. By the way, if you go to Russia for the first time, don't go in January <laughs> because it would really discourage you from going back. I'm standing in the middle of Red Square. The wind is whipping through Red Square. A lot of people around, tourists and other people just walking around. Lenin's tomb there and the Kremlin there. Uh, all of these, all of these images that I'd seen growing up. And now here I am standing in the middle of Red Square knowing that in six months, I was going to move my family there. And I had this overwhelming sense of unworthiness. I had this sense of, I can't do it. I don't know where to start. This heavy feeling, and it was also, there was also in there some, this, this sense of um, godlessness for some reason. And all of that piled up on top of each other, and I said to myself, I, I can't do this. And at that moment, the Lord kind of moved in. He's even at Red Square, by the way. He moved in and said, I will be with you always. And the sense of that God isn't calling me or asking me to do something, that he isn't already there, will be with me, and will stick around after I leave. It's all about the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. See, that helps me in my current transition in life. Maybe I can trust the Lord in this transition too. The Lord is my shepherd is a <clears throat> radical statement, I think, for our culture, for the, 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 the country, the, the area that we grow up, that we've grown up in. It is radical. Do you agree? I mean, why would it be radical, a radical statement for us? The Lord is my shepherd in our context. We can do it ourselves is the theme of our, our uh, prayer culture. And, and, right. and now it's trending that the government will take care of it. Well, and we're all, it's like so an aspiration to to a menial task. Um, it is a choice that the God of the universe stepped down into one of the worst jobs to herd a bunch of people that really didn't want to be herded. Uh -huh. <laughs> what was your first clue? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, yeah, it, it is a thank <clears throat> thankless task. You know when Americans would go over to Russia, Russians think we're arrogant. Maybe we are. But I think some of it is we are self-confident. 
somewhat. We're taught to be hold our head up, look people in the eye. Russians walk around like this. They don't look people in the eye. And they, they don't have a lot of confidence. But I think all the good things that you could say about this confidence thing, our enemy uses it against us too. The Lord is my shepherd. We have been trained pretty well in schools, in seminary. We are pretty good at what we do. So you could say, even as a pastor that, that is pretty good at the routine of being a pastor, you really don't need God to get the job done, whatever the job is. We are good. Americans can do. How many times do we walk into a, a Russian, Russian office, a government office, with one of our Russians, and we ask a question, the government person says no, and our <clears throat> Russian starts walking out the door. And we say, why not? <laughs> and the government person has this look on their face, nobody has ever asked me why, I've never had to explain myself, what is your problem? Well, it's this, it's this can-do spirit. But, there are certain things that we shouldn't try, nothing should we try to do on our own. But this self-sufficiency, I can do it, sometimes for people like us gets in the way when we say, the Lord is my shepherd. That is radical trust in a God in whom all things are possible. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. See, the Lord is my shepherd in this context, this self-sufficiency that we deal with. The Lord is my shepherd is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Anybody know that off the top of their head? Trust the Lord, Trust the Lord with all your heart, lay not under your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct you. That might work in this transition in my life. The Lord is my shepherd means I trust completely in him. And that's not easy for me to do. See, the Lord is my shepherd invites us to live as God's children humbly and graciously. Ah, should I, should I say this? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> used to travel around East Ohio, go to church from church to church to church. In some of those churches, I didn't run into very gracious people. <laughs> Not too many humble people. I wonder what the church would be like today. Let's just say our church. What would it be like today if all of us took humility and graciousness seriously? Just across the page in my Bible, in Psalm 25, it's verse 9, it says, if I can read this, He guides the humble in what is right and, re and teaches them his way. Why do you think this humility thing is so important to God for his people? Why is humility so important? David. Well, I think that in relation to the shepherd as well as Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, this verse... It is an acknowledgement that God is in control and that we have committed ourselves to serve him, not us. And uh, so it's, it's, it's acknowledging that God, that we want God in control. We are accepting, we're asking God to be in control of our lives. We're submitting to him. Amen. Yes. I've noticed that when pride rises up within me, uh, it really, uh, on a personal level, it really screws things up. <laughs> I'll just say something and I'll think, and it'll give, sometimes it'll take me a day and I'll say, oh no, oh no, what have I done? That was pride, that was not humility. Humility bowed low before the Father. Yes. Confidence in its worst sense can lead to arrogance, which leads to rapid decisions, quick decisions that may not always have a bird's eye view of everything. And so the faster the pace you go at, the fewer things you're going to observe, therefore the less information you're going to have about making decisions. 
the well, slower you can go, the calmer you can be, the more information that you can be given, and obviously allowing God to help you to have eyes that can really see. So would you say humility has something to do with pace? Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit. Wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we see somebody who needs needs something, I don't have any problem helping them. There might be something even greater there that needs to be done in our quick intervention. While it, it, it can be useful at times, it can also sure. serve to be a detriment. I think that's why it's important to be humble before the Lord and to be intimately connected to him because then he tells us when to be quick and when to slow down. I think humility in the church can manifest itself in how we react to each other. For example, not everything in the church goes the way I want it to go. I don't agree with everything in the church that happens. But do I react to that or should I react to that or should I just, just kind of wait and see how it goes? In other words, humility means I don't always have to be right. Mm -hmm. I don't have to prove myself right. Pastor does something I don't like, or whoever, whoever. I don't have to jump in and try to fix it based on my opinion until I allow God to work on my heart to see. Maybe that is the right thing. Humility would go a long way to making the church more the church that God wants it to be. Somebody say amen. amen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. That's important to God for his people to be, to be humble. Dr. Greathouse told us a story in class one time. He said when he was a young pastor, he was, the district superintendent called and said, said, Bill, I've got a tough assignment for you. I've got this church split down the middle, but neither group will leave. I need you to go, and I need you to pastor this church and, and try to save it, Bill. I, please, please help me and go. So he said, uh, Dr. Redhouse said, Ruth and I, <coughs> Ruth and I prayed. <laughs> and, and we decided we should go. So he went to this church. He didn't say what church it was. I don't know what church it was. So he said, he said we were at this church. He said, I was, I was working and praying my we were praying my heart out. Four years, I preached to this group. Preached my heart out. One group would sit over here. One group would sit over here. And there's some little neutral group in the middle. And whenever I would say something that this group thought was directed at that group, they would do amen bombs. Amen. Yeah. Amen. No one was coming to church for the right reason. And he said, one Sunday night, Ruth and I had been praying for four years. We were tired. We were worn out. We were spiritually wounded. We were praying, praying. Sunday night, four years. I, was preached, I preached a sermon. It was nothing out of the ordinary, Sunday, regular Sunday night service. And I came to the end of my message, and I started to pray the benediction. I heard some rustling. And I kind of opened my eyes while I was praying, and the leader of this group came down and knelt at the altar. I kept praying, he said. I heard some more rustling. The leader of this group, they didn't see each other. This leader came down and knelt. I kept praying. He said, I just kept praying, and I kind of was looking out of the corner of my eye. And, and for some reason, this guy and this guy looked up at the same time and saw the other one at the end of the altar. And they crawled across the front of the church and embraced and wept, asked for forgiveness, and then all heaven broke loose. <laughs> and this group came over to this group. They met in the middle, it's kind of this independent group. This group were going, Well, like, amen, whatever. <laughs> we're starting hugging everybody, too. You know why that happened? Two men decided to be humble before God and say, apparently, it's not about me anymore. Humble. See, the Lord is my shepherd means I'm going to be humble before the Lord. It's not about me. It's about the Father. I think the church would be a different place if we were more humble. 
Okay, that's good. That'll help me. Humility will help me because I have to say a lot, yes, dear. I have to say it as you wish. So I have to have to have my humble gene ratcheted up a little bit. So that helped me. The Lord is my shepherd. According to the psalmist, somebody say amen. <laughs> no. I was thinking you're enjoying having a platform to pick on me again. <laughs> this has been our marriage. We're, we're, we're trying not to throw any bombs. You know? No, okay. <laughs> oh, that's right. Water balloons from here. The Lord is my shepherd. That's right. I lack nothing. Amen. Do you lack things? You lack a dry house. Yeah, I lack a dry house. <laughs> but even with a dry, even with a wet house, I mean, I've been in parts of the world worshiping with poor people. I mean, dirt poor, subsistence farming people. That if they don't find food, somebody in the family dies. I mean, I've worshipped with people like that, and they they get emotional. They sing praises to God. They are grateful. They are thankful to God for who they are and what they have. Going, that doesn't make a bit of sense to me. Because, you know, I have everything I need and most of what I want. I have, I could say I have everything I want. And yet still, at time, I focus more on what I lack than what I have. Again, meeting with church boards, you would, as a district superintendent, you would hear them talk about what they don't have. Our pastor doesn't have this or whatever, or we don't have enough money, or we don't have young people. You know what we need there, Pastor Chuck? What we need is a young pastor to bring in young families, and they're all 80 or more. <laughs> so they're talking about what they lack, and I had the privilege every time to say, but do you know who you have? Mm-hmm. You have the God of all creation. This is not the end of the day. God is with you. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Do you think that? Do you believe that? Do you feel like that? Even in the situation you're in now, with your physical, your situation, your economic situation, whatever it is, Do you sense that you lack nothing in Christ? A few head nods. What does it mean to you as a follower of God to live in the realm of lacking nothing? What's it mean? I think you're more generous. Generous. To a fault? (laughs) Usually not. No, it's because you're living in the I lack nothing. Moving ahead to the passage that says my couple of flows, his blessings to us, especially here in America, are so overflowing that it prompts us to give. Amen. Give time, give money, give food, give attention. Pack food. Exactly share the overflow of blessings and it also prompts me to more gratitude humility and graciousness i lack nothing for me it's to be thankful and focused on his presence whatever's going on in my life mm-hmm. amen mm-hmm. amen melissa mm-hmm. melissa right mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Often, when I <clears throat> read passages and <clears throat> ponder my question to the Lord and my prayer is, what does that look like in everyday life? You know, what does that look like to me? Mm. And when we get to a passage like like this. You know, it, it raises for me the conflict that I don't know if it underlies everybody, but the conflict is God in charge of everything or just the big things? Um, you know, we've had 
this discussion and had this discussion with Albert about we give thanks for everything, we give thanks in, in everything. Mm -hmm. And it raises that conflict. What is, how does God interact with us? Does he control everything? How much latitude does he give us and then pick up the pieces afterwards? But, you know, if I'm going to lack nothing, then I have to believe that God has his finger on the balance all the time. And uh, okay. otherwise, you know, I can't, I can't believe that, mm -hmm. that passage. Right, and, and my example is these poor people I was talking about because they know more about that than I do. I lack nothing, yet still my cup overflows. So my, 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 um, my response to them, or to, to us would be, it is possible to lack nothing, even if you have nothing. Yes? What if it, whenever we're saying God's gonna give us the desires of our heart, if the desire of our heart is relationship with God, mm. then that is everything, mm -hmm. regardless of food, health, or wealth. Mm -hmm. Amen. And that it is that God is the one that's enabling and empowering us to be able to do the things that we do. It is our obedience to Him and His drawing in our life, whether it seems rational or not. So we can be thankful and grateful in each one of these things because our desire of our heart is relationship with God. And that is something that can't be taken away by the Russian government or any other powers that be because it is God enabling us, our life, right now, for Rus your Russian example, to join together in fear, in love, in supporting one another. And I think that can bring that, that's a different realm whenever you're talking about him being our shepherd. It is him guiding and leading and that we are the dumb sheep that whenever we get out on our own, we're going to get eaten by the wolf. Mm -hmm. But he's the one that comes and strikes the wolf and brings us back into the fold and says, no, you are mine. I'm going to take care of you. Amen. No matter what you think, you're going to do the wrong thing off on your own. Come here and let me lead you. Let me help you. Let me protect you. We have to realize that he is the shepherd and we're the dumb sheep. Mm -hmm. I think... And it says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare the table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <laughs> he is my shepherd. Yes. I think when we read the 23rd Psalm, we sometimes overlook the sheep. And what you just said, uh, and I know you were saying it a bit facetiously, but, or lightheartedly, but the dumb sheep. Hey. But the dumb sheep still has to make a choice. And God didn't make us to not make choices. Right. Right. So there's a partnership arrangement here. Mm -hmm. And when the shepherd is the shepherd, there's still somebody that has to be participating. Right. When you talk about humility, um, when I was in medical school years ago, I had a, a resident, senior resident ahead of me that had been a professor in a Catholic seminary and decided he wanted to go to medical school. And at that time, the Catholic Church did not allow that kind of thing. But anyhow, Dr. Seward went to medical school and he was one of the three most brilliant people I've ever met in my life. And he used to define humility. If you're the worst or the best bum on the face of the earth, you know it. <laughs> if you're the greatest president or the greatest human being that's ever lived, you know it. You don't brag about it. Mm -hmm. Or you don't berate yourself for it. In other words, what he said, it's the simple acknowledgement of who you are. And this song, it seems to me that this is expressing that. Mm. 
is expressing the knowledge of God is God, but I think it's still expressing that you are you. Mm -hmm. sure. And so I ask you the question, whenever you make a statement, when we make a statement, when we interpret this statement, I shall not want, I'm not so sure we're parsing words. If I don't have anything, I'm still wanting. That doesn't mean I can't be honoring God. But where does choice come in all of this in terms of how you're reconciling these things? Well, there, there's one choice. There's one choice as, as in our relationship, God and us. There's one choice that's most important than any, anything else, and that's the choice to be intimately connected to God. And then every other choice after that, God directs. I think where the sheep get in trouble is when we start making decisions apart from the shepherd. So the first choice we make is, God is, he is my shepherd, and he is, I mean, everything I do after that is directed and led and guided by him. When we get away from that, I think we start to have trouble as, at becoming dumb sheep, maybe. But that's my concern that we have here. I think we as Christians, and particularly evangelicals, I think we tend to almost be little or minimize the value of choice. I completely concur with what you just said, but you still got to make choice. Sure. You still got to be a part of the equation. Absolutely. And I agree with you that you got to put God up there, but God expects us to engage. Absolutely. I agree with that 100%. 100%. Yes. It seems that part of the issue here, it goes back to that phrase, I lack nothing, I have everything I need, uh, even one translation, I have everything I want. Mm -hmm. At some point, we have to determine the ultimate foundation for our security. And even we believers can find our security in the things we own, mm -hmm. the houses we have, the income we have the status we sure, have. Sure. This passage seems to be saying, my ultimate security is in him. Mm -hmm. When I can find that place of ultimate security, then the choices I make are going to be altered by the very fact that I'm not having to make choices to earn security or accumulate security any place else. And isn't that a choice that we have to make daily? What, when are we finished? Now? 10 30. 10 30. 30. Huh? 11 30. 11 30. Okay. okay. I've got some more stories. <laughs> well, let's, go, let's go back to Proverbs 3 5 and 6. That says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. We start there. Mm -hmm. yeah. In all your ways, acknowledge him. In other words, in simple English, don't try figuring everything out. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. But in all your ways, acknowledge him. That's saying, Lord, I love you. I trust you. I'm <coughs> not trying to figure it all out. But I acknowledge that you're in charge of my life. <coughs> yes, there's choice. But I acknowledge I'm starting with you. And then it says he'll direct our paths. He will guide us. But it's our acknowledgement of him as being in charge because we love him yeah. and uh, we may not make sense of everything yeah. but uh, we are acknowledging that he is in charge and we're allowing him then to direct our paths yeah and I think the, I think that when that the longer that I am an intimate follower of, of God the more my choices line my choices line up with him my prayer for my children is it doesn't take them so as long to figure that out as it did me because in that, in that period, they're, they're, this is when we get ourselves sometimes in trouble as, as God-following sheep, when we, when we take some of the choices out of his lap, so to speak, uh, or the, the, the choices that aren't directed by him. Um, I've got a simple mind. And in my mind, if, if, if I am intimately connected to the God of all creation, I am humble before him. I understand, or I'm learning to understand who he is and who I am, and I am going to him for every decision, not taking one step without God. He will direct my path. That choice was to be in that relationship with him, and all the, every other choice after that 
I believe flows out of that. Do you, do you, do you, do you agree with that, Carol? Well, I agree with that mostly, but I've observed throughout these 76 years that I've lived in my own life as well as others, people who were incredibly sincere in their motivation and their commitment to God and to the Lord's word and everything else. And they followed in making their choice, what they thought was their direction. But then things went south. Mm -hmm. And so that choice turned out, in hindsight, on its face, just that, to be a bad choice. Mm -hmm. And that's where I see the conflict comes into this if we go too far. Yeah, okay, but I think that when that happens is when a humble person before God says, Father, forgive me. Well, I understand that I, part. I messed, I messed it. Well, I appreciate that part, but still, yeah. the, the, the result is what it is. Yeah. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't read and write history. Right, right. Yeah. Chuck, I think marriage is a very good example of this. Hmm. When I fell in love with Jess, and married him, there was, <laughs> there was not ever a choice that he did not figure into. Mm -hmm. Everything, everything I say, everything I do, everywhere I go, everything figures into the fact that I am a married woman. That does not change. It doesn't ever change that I am a child of God, that he is my shepherd. Once I make that choice, now I'm not talking about eternal security. <laughs> once I make that choice, once I really make that choice, every other thing in my life comes under that. I think Nazarenes are more secure than we have given ourselves credit for. I think we are. I don't think it's as easy for God to turn his back on us, as we yeah. think, as we have thought, maybe. But, yes. That doesn't imply that even in the <clears throat> great marriages, and we have one of the best, mm -hmm. that we won't at times look back and say, well, I wish we made that choice instead of that. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. That's part of the frailty that we're a part of. <coughs> it is not that it's part of us, it is we sure. are part of that sure. frailty. Yeah. But even then, that utter surrender to the reality of the marriage primarily of that relationship with God what he preserved it's the aroma of Christ Amen. That Paul talks about. Amen. and we, we all do live in a corrupt sin corrupted world and that that taints stuff but we can be set free I believe in the power of the spirit uh, I, Isaiah 40 says among other things the prophet Isaiah saw God as a shepherd who tends his flock, <coughs> gathers his lambs in his arms. <laughs> That's me he's talking about. And carries them close to his heart. Mm -hmm. If I'm living in that relationship, mm -hmm. a lamb in his arms close to his heart, it would seem to me that it would get harder and harder for me to make a choice that doesn't please him. <sighs> Hold me close, Father. Hold me close. As I have my arms wrapped around his neck. Ezekiel 34 says this. He, Ezekiel portrayed the Lord as a faithful shepherd who would rescue his scattered flocks. I needed to be rescued at times. Bind up the injured and strengthen the weak and tend them in good pasture. I will lack nothing. <laughs> Part of the Lord's Prayer talks about preparing the table before him. What do we do today that illustrates that? In church. Verse 5. Thou preparest a table before me. The Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, which we will participate in this morning. As we participate in the Lord's Supper this morning, my hope and prayer is that as we walk down and receive the elements, that we would understand that the Lord is my shepherd. At the beginning, I didn't tell you the whole story because I said I did this to help me, for you to help me. And you have, thank you. 
But I also did this because I felt like there are people in this class that needed to be reminded again, the Lord is my shepherd. I hear the requests. I hear people's hearts, this, this, the, even the cry of the heart sometime for what the situation that I, that I find myself in. And so I just want to remind all of us and pray for us. I want to take a moment and pray for you that the Lord is my shepherd and he's yours too. Amen. Who, who read that? Who read? Would somebody read that one more time? Oh, Carol Ethel, then forget it. She left. We're not going to read it. <laughs> I was going to pray for Carol today. So let me start by praying for her. Let's pray together. Lord, may Carol know right now that you are her shepherd. May you fall upon her today. May the worship service be just what she needs to encourage her heart. And Lord, if she were here, we could lay our hands on her and pray on her behalf that you would sustain her and that she would really know that she lacks nothing, even in the midst of the pain and the suffering she's going through now. I think of Melissa, Lord. I just ask that you would touch her physically. I ask, Father, that she would sense even right now your presence in her life. Lord, there are people in this room right now, probably, that are going through dark valleys. I ask, Lord, that they would see your light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. I ask, Lord, that each one would be drawn to your bright, warm, sustaining, guiding light. Lord, there are people in this class that are dealing with physical issues. I pray right now, Lord, that you would be their shepherd and that they would sense you guiding them each step of the way. I thank you, Lord, for your healing touch. I ask that you would put your hand of healing upon those in this class who need it most. I thank you, Lord, for how you touch us intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, physically, in all ways, Lord. You are so faithful. But then again, it's not a surprise when we realize that you are our shepherd yes. who loves us and gathers us in your arms and holds us close. Oh, to be held close by the God of all creation. Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would fill and overflow every single person in this room. And those that aren't here, that are normally here, we pray for Roger today as he preaches. I ask, Lord, that you would speak through him. Help him to sense the shepherd with him today. And Lord, I just ask that you would use us in your kingdom to make a difference for you. Even where we live right now, there are people around us that desperately need to know Jesus. So Lord, would you use us? Would you help us to have eyes that see people around us that we have just overlooked maybe for years? I ask, Lord, that you would guide us to the ones that need you most. And perhaps, Lord, there are some people that we could, by your grace, and help rescue on your behalf. So thank you, Lord, for these moments we've had together. Thank you for the reminder again that you are our shepherd, and we must choose to follow you, as Carol has pointed out. Lord, thank you that you've given us the freedom and the ability and the grace to choose the Lord as our shepherd. May you go with us. May you draw us near and hold us close. In the precious name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. 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 Bless you. Thanks, Bless John. you.